how are you doing today? Thank you for being here. Uh, we have a wonderful event ahead of us. Uh, we'd just like to take a second to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. So please turn your videos on so that this can be an interactive conversation with curator Marina Reyes Franco. Uh, just a brief intro. Uh, this uh, program is brought to you by the Latino Alumni Association of Columbia University, or LACU. And we are dedicated to serving the needs of the Latino community. LACO exists to support, promote, and channel the academic, social, professional, and developmental interests of Colombia Latino community, both past and present. So, a uh, warm welcome, bienvenidos again a todos. A uh, um, short bio here for our presenter today, Marina Reyes Franco, is a curator at the Museo de Arte Contemporáneo de Puerto Rico, MAC. In 2010, she co-founded La N in Buenos Aires an itinerary museum and collection. Recent projects include El Momento del Diagrumo and La Llave, La Clave at MAC, San Juan, De Loiza a La Loiza at MAC, in El Barrio Public Art Commission by Daniel Lid Ramos, Resistant Paradise at Publica, San Juan, and Forende Darling, Montreal, Watching Your Step, Mind Your Head, IFA Gallery Berlin, the second Grand Tropical by Enian in Loiza, Puerto Rico, Sucursal Malva in Buenos Aires, and numerous exhibitions at La N. So, reminder, this is a conversation, so we hope that all of you will get engaged, have fun. It's a, it's a very important topic that we're going to be covering, and we want all of your opinions as we progress. So, curator Marina Reyes Franco, welcome, and please walk us through this excellent topic. Yes. Uh, um, thank you, Carolina, Jenna, and everybody here. Uh, Maria, Jesenia, Carla, Annette, Patrick, uh, Diana, Desi, thank you for coming. Let's see if more people come on as well. I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen. Wait a second. <laughs> Let me see how I do this. <laughs> Yay. Okay, perfect. Got it. <laughs> So um, as Carolina mentioned, my name is Marina Reyes Franco. I'm a curator at the MAC, which is the Museum of Contemporary Art here in, in Puerto Rico. And since, in, since this is an alumni event, uh, I just wanted to share that I didn't uh, start my uh, start of my studies within the humanities or art history or art, actually. I was actually rather interested in political science, uh, but as I became, disillusioned with it, I would say, uh, that eventually led me to think more about and reflect on the cultural impact uh, and the products, like the kind of the byproducts of social, political, and economic circumstances. So that has always informed my way of, you know, just my way of approaching art, its analysis, but also the kind of pieces that I'm interested in and the kind of exhibitions that I want to make. <laughs> um, so I, I just, I would like to make this talk also participatory. So if you'd like, please share your city or country of origin and field of study in the chat section. That would be great. Um, also feel free to use the chat throughout the talk or raise your virtual hand if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment. Um, that'd be, I mean, that, that'd be great. Uh, Let's see if I can actually look like look you up. I can't see the chat. Yes, the chat is here. I can see the chat now. Perfect. Um, so I can see the chat while I am reading the, <laughs> the notes on the slides. Uh, this is perfect. Okay. Uh, so feel free to use it, raise your hand. And if I don't see you uh, raising your hand, Car Carolina or Jenna, like, please let me know if someone wants to talk because I don't see everybody at the same time. Um, we'll also have a Q&A at the end, but just know that you can comment, you know, on anything at any moment. Uh, from Peru and U.S., interested in conservation, art and cultural heritage. Great, thank you, Patrick. Uh, so everybody else can just, uh, you know, share in the chat. Great, Jasenia, New York of Dominican descent. We'll have some. We'll have some art also by a Dominican artist. Uh, who lives in New York, Jody Minaya. Uh, so maybe, you know, 
you're in chemical engineering, but you know, maybe you'll also become interested in what she does and check her out. So we're going to talk about this exhibition, El Momento del Diagromo. This was a show that I organized last year, um, and it was up between April and September of last year. It was my second show as a curator at the MAC, but it was my first group show. Uh, so I really wanted it to be, uh, you know, I really wanted to share my experiences and observations from several years of travel around Latin America and the Caribbean. I lived in Argentina for a while. I lived in Chile while I was studying as well. Uh, and I came back to live in Puerto Rico in 20, 2014. <laughs> so I spent almost seven years abroad. And when I came back, I just, I, I was starting to see several like, connections between artist practice conversations and that we were having and changes in approach on how like artists were making their work but also their concerns as citizens and sometimes as activists as well. And simply as people living through, you know, different difficult like environmental situations. Um, obviously this exhibition having been organized in Puerto Rico and I'll explain soon why uh, the, the reason for the title. Uh, it's also very much like a post hurricane. Uh, it, I mean, it is an exhibition that happened post hurricane, but I wanted the hurricane to be like, it's specifically Hurricane Maria to be uh, more of like a specter that uh, was, that surrounded the exhibition, but not something that was overtly uh, presented or um, represented in the exhibition. So we're not gonna, so the works that I'm gonna talk about here, um, um, and actually none of the works that were part of the exhibition actually uh, represent like disasters or um, anything that um, that would kind of, you know, call to mind like a natural disaster or um, yeah, there, there are no blue tarps basically. Uh, that was not my intention. I didn't, there was a very specific attempt to talk about the issues that also affect uh, this climate situation, but at the same time, not, uh, not repeat ourselves. So like we are already traumatized, so we don't need to see the same images again. Um, the Momento del Yagrumo translates as the, the moment of the Yagrumo. The Yagrumo, we'll see now. Uh, the exhibition actually examines the rights of nature and sovereignty and resistant move movements and the recovery of knowledge through um, artisanal practices as incorporated into contemporary art practices by artists located in the Caribbean and, and the Americas. So uh, the diagromo, which is this plant, I mean, we call it diagromo in Puerto Rico. If you are from another part of the Americas that calls it any other way, uh, I mean, you can, you can also write in the chat how you'd call it. Uh, I know that there are some places where it is called Jarumo uh, or Guarumo. I'm going to write down how we, uh, I can't write apparently. <laughs> I can't write in the chat. My, yeah, I can't write in the chat, I'm sorry. Um, but if anyone recognizes the plant, you can also write uh, how you, um, how it is called where you're from or what from like where your family's from. In Puerto Rico, it's Yagrumo, which is Y-A-G-U-M, so, sorry, G-R-U-M-O, Yagrumo. But I understand that in uh, Colombia, for example, it's uh, Yarumo or Yarumito. Uh, there are other parts of Colombia or Central America where it's Guarumo, Guarumbo. Uh, in the US, I think it also translates as like trumpet tree, uh, but it's from the Secropia family. Uh, in Puerto Rico, I became aware of the plant. I mean, everybody knows the plant, but I became aware of how it relates to this like kind of post hurricane moment when I was talking to a friend, uh, Tara Rodriguez Besosa, who runs one of the projects that is included in the in the exhibition, and she mentioned that she had visited El Junque, which is uh, a national rainforest, uh, and she had talked to this, uh, to the scientist who was trying to convey to the visitors 
how like all the like all the things that they were finding out post hurricane like all the studies that they were making and he was trying to boil it down to like very simple uh to some very simple points and he said we are in the moment of the Yagrumo. so the moment of the Yagrumo is right after a storm uh and this when the strongest trees in the tropical forest fall and then there is an it so that creates an unexpected clearing in the forest and that's when the yagrumo can germinate so the yagrumo can actually you know grow because all the other trees that were uh that were taking over the, the space and that were uh consuming the sunlight then finally i mean they're they're gone so the yagrumo can actually grow uh, but the problem is that this tree is much weaker. And although its sprouts give the sensation of, and, and greenery that indicate recovery and fast recovery, definitely, they will also be easier to fall in future storms. So the problem that this creates, particularly in a tropical forest, such as El Junque, is that as more, uh, you know, as now we have more uh, extreme and more frequent storms, such as what happened in 2017 when we had Irma and then two weeks later we had uh, Maria. Uh, when we have this kind of uh, successive, uh, you know, terrifying huge storms coming over, this also can accelerate the processes in which forests themselves help create the global warming that destroys them. So uh, basically what happens is that there is this clearing, the Yagrumo, you know, there are sprouts, they, they, it grows, but then when another storm comes, it just, you know, it creates more um, vegetative material, and that also emanates CO2. So then there is this, uh, basically like this greenhouse effect happening in the, in the forest itself. So instead of like the, the rainforest being a lung, it also becomes an, a net emitter of uh, CO2. So the Yagrumo moment is like a, simultaneously a metaphor for post-hurricane recovery, but also the urgency for deeper changes in our relationship with, with nature. Um, I invited artists from different parts of, uh, of the Caribbean, Latin America, and some artists that were also, uh, well, like Joyri, who lives in uh, Dominican, who lives in New York. Uh, there's also a Swiss artist called Ursula Biemann who worked with Ta uh, Paulo Tavares, Brazilian artist, to develop a project in, in Ecuador about the Amazon forest. So the group of artists uh, share interest in a growing appreciation and study of the vernacular and approaches, and they approach art from regenerative practices. Uh, they're interested in the use of natural materials and local production and consumption towards the true emancipation. Others use technology and its ways of representing nature to reflect on the social and cultural effects of our exploration of the world uh, and the universe. Um, this, this was the entrance to the exhibition. Um, and I would like to ask everybody to please comment, like what does the installation remind you of? What does that shape evoke? If we can, you know, oh, quickly type type it up. Um, when I was when I was like when I referred to how artists reinterpret uh, nature, but also yeah, like use technology to do that, I was referring, for example, to the work of uh, uh, Guillermo Rodriguez. We can see like the the triptych in the on the wall, uh, but now which resembles like Doppler, like uh, Doppler uh, radar images. And then the, um, the installation on the floor is by Carolina Caicedo, who, yes, it is a, yeah, it represents a river. Uh, it is wavy. <laughs> uh, actually, the, um, there's something very interesting about the way that, it, that the paper is folded, um, but I'll get to that in a minute when I can show you uh, a closer, a closer image. Serpent River Book and River Table, which is the name of this installation, um, it actually consists of two things. Uh, there is the artist book, which is what we see displayed on the, like, on the table, and then the, uh, the river-shaped 
table. This has very different ways of being configured. This is the uh, kind of low, uh, low table version of it, but it can also be like higher up or divided into different subsections. It can go like a counter, like on the wall as well. So it's a very flexible, um, it's a very flexible installation that can work on very different uh, spaces. This is about 17 feet by 20 or 24, I don't remember right now. So it's pretty substantial. Um, and it is part of a wider body of work that is called Be Damned. Um, she uses Be Damned, um, as a as a reference to both like damnation, but also uh, the system of dams and what containing water does uh, in society, just like con like dams that are used to contain bodies of water, but also how water in general is used as a repressive tool. Like it can be a giver of life, as it has been historically. I mean. It, that's how civilizations have been developed throughout human history uh, around bodies of waters and rivers. But um, then when you have uh, dams or you know, man-made channels or you affect bodies of water um, in different ways, I mean, we have to consider that uh, there are also social bodies, that there are lives uh, that have developed around them uh, and there are economies that depend on them as well. Um, so Be Damned is like this very expansive uh, body of work that uh, has expanded like from books to, uh, to performances, photography, installations, sculptures. Um, and she's been working on it, I believe like for over 10 years now. Um, the book is divided into five chapters and they encompass like different things like uh, indigenous understandings of rivers, the relation and equilibrium between the river, uh, like how, for example, people can have uh, a, more, um, a more balanced relationship to the river, like it's not completely extractive, like uh, in the colonial corporate uh, relationship to, to rivers but it's actually more like artisanal mining or fishing, like subsistence uh, fishing, for example. Uh, but then we get to a point where it is the corporate relationship to the river where it's like based on extractive practices. Uh, and then it just gets out of control because like, uh, you know, rivers overflow, uh, rivers don't necessarily follow you know, uh, what we want them to do. And, and then they create, they also create disasters. Um, and eventually uh, the book also presents, like, she also presents other, uh, other moments within the book where people are resisting, like actively resisting and performing and being part of the events that she has been a part of as an activist as well. Um, it, for example, with the Juma Resiste movement, um, and other, and other groups. I want to, I wanted to show you this just to, just to, you, you can see the, the, the shape and think about the flexibility of the installation. Uh, it consists of five separate, uh, wooden panels, so they can actually be taken apart and reconfigured, uh, so they can fit into other spaces. The book has also been used since they are separate pieces. Uh, the book itself is a collectible. Uh, it is part of our collection now uh, at the museum. And what's great about the book is that it, it has two sides. So one side, which is the one that we're showing right now, um, the, the one that is shown when it, when it is on installation, it has images such as these um, and this, which are collages that she has created um, and sourced, um, images that she has taken and sourced uh, from different travels and different events that she has been a part of. But also um, on the other side, she has included several, several texts, both uh, you know, coming from her own research, but also from, like, from her own 
writing. So it is an educational tool. Uh, it has also been used um, as part of performance and, and dance performances when the, when the book is presented. And it is like a community educational tool, really. Um, I wanted to call like attention to these shapes that we're seeing throughout the um, throughout the book. Um, they are different triangles that are created. Um, of course, they are at once meant to help evoke the shape of the of the river, which is also a serpent. Um, but it's very interesting that the way that she got there uh, and kind of figured out how to how to do this uh, was via studying the Berlin Wall maps. So the Berlin Wall, since it was cir uh, circular, um, it actually had to be put together in this way where there were folded papers. Um, so that was something that helped Carolina uh, come up with an idea of how to kind of you know solve the piece, the visual presentation of the piece. So some of the some of the images that you see here, you'll see like folded up uh, in the in the installation, and then she creates like all these kind of topographies uh, and waves, as um, as Elizabeth pointed out in the in the chat. Um, elsewhere in the gallery, we have this work, and I'd like you to look at it and tell me what you see. Uh, if you can please put it in the chat, that'd be great. <laughs> um, there's definitely like a little mermaid <laughs> character. Um, Carla says, uh, Taino textile patterns and mermaids, birds. That's Carolina, Mermaid, Jesenia. Yes. Well, I'll tell you. Um, okay, this is um, this is a textile piece. It's in acrylic wool, which is interesting because it's not like the super traditional kind of textile that um, that is. Like, Oh, great. Jennifer saw a profile. That's very good. I'll get, I'll get back to that. And a river. Yes, Desi. Yes, there's a river as well. Um, actually, there's a bunch of rivers, uh, many, many rivers. Uh, this piece is called Silat, and it's by the Grupo Tañi. Grupo Tañi means uh, we come from the mountains. And uh, it's a group of weavers from um, two communities in, in Salta in Argentina, in Northern Argentina. Um, there is, I believe, five women, Anabel Luna, Miriam Perez, Ana Lopez, Graciela Lopez, and Clementina Perez from two communities of El Bordo and La Puntana Grande in Salta. And they made this work in collaboration with Guido Janito, who's another, another artist from Salta, although he, like, they're indigenous and he's not. Um, but they made this collaboration because uh, they were part of an exhibition in Berlin that was reflecting on like conditions in the, in, in, well, in the Gran Chaco, which is an area that encompasses various, uh, like it, it's a big area that it's actually like several, takes up several um, like parts of different countries. Like it's, it's in Bolivia, it's in Argentina, it's also, it, it takes up like parts of uh, Paraguay as well. So there is a whole region that is called Gran Chaco. And the exhibition was reflecting on that, like on that region and the people who live there, the kind of artisanal work that they do. And Guido has been a longtime collaborator of these communities uh, because he's also a weaver. And there's like a long, um, kind of, it's a long, tradition of contemporary art and textiles in Salta. So he kind of learned from that school and now he's in active collaboration with these communities as well. Um, everything that you mentioned 
that's there. We can we'll have a closer look now. Um, and someone said, Jennifer Fuentes, she said that she saw a profile face. So that's very interesting because that's what I saw too. Um, but then when I when I talked to Gilo and when I got you know what uh, these witchy women were referring to, I there the piece really came about in a conversation a lot of whatsapp messages were happening here uh it was a collaboration that was developed during the the pandemic so a lot of it was through whatsapp and a lot of you know sending images um and references so the way that that it worked was that guido was interested in kind of reinterpreting these maps, he's been very interested for a long time in hydrographic maps. And he had a bunch of hydrographic maps from the Gran Chaco region. And there were several pieces that are part of this collaboration between the Wichi women uh, uh, of the, that make up this uh, kind of weaving co-op uh, Grupo Dañi and himself. So they divided the different maps and that is the central image, the kind of profile face that you see. I also see kind of like a root human rooster uh, thing, <laughs> but all the different lines that you see are part of like readings of hydrographic maps. And then he was asking uh, the women like what else they thought that existed around the, uh, around the water and around the rivers. So they, they said, well, there's, you know, mermaids, obviously, and the, then there's these birds. And they also came up with, you know, just the different traditional shapes um, and not necessarily colors, but definitely uh, the shapes that we, we see like uh, on top, in the bottom, and then uh, the kind of wavy river shapes in the, in the middle of the textile. Um, so those were the references that they were making to the river itself and to kind of like signatures of the um, of like witchy weaving. The the way that Grupo Tañi came about is really interesting because uh, they were founded in 2015 and it really um, and it really came about because of like different government efforts <laughs> um, to incentivize the economies around their traditional practices um, and foster innovative techniques, etc. So the reason why they're using acrylic wool is because it is more readily accessible. Um, it, it is more, um, it's more convenient and it also, it really doesn't hurt their hands. So they don't have to go out and, um, and get chawar, which is, uh, you know, a, a plant that they'll get eventually get the textile uh, from, get the thread from, because it really hurts their hands. And that represents like a whole day out in the sun uh, looking for the plant. Uh, so there is this recognition that they don't have to live in the past and they don't represent a past but rather like contemporary indigenous practices that in order to, to continue and uh, enable to survive and thrive, they also have to kind of get with the times. And that also means change, sometimes changing their, their materials. So they'll go from creating pieces like very um, you know, traditionally sourced pieces uh, with with natural fibers to these uh, acrylic wool pieces, and sometimes they also do textiles uh, completely in plastic, uh, just like refurbishing, not refurbishing, <laughs> kind of um, basically using uh, plastic bags and making thread out of plastic bags. Uh, so the chosen title means kind of relates to this. Uh, call for representation and contemporary representation. Uh, so the title is Silat, which means a notice, like an announcement uh, or a warning. And um, basically it's just them saying that we have always been here 
uh, and that they represent the future. So it's kind of like we're here, you know. Um, so elsewhere in the uh, in the exhibition, we'll see as we walked over to the next gallery, uh, there is this uh, little pop up, and I I couldn't quite get like a closer picture for some reason. I couldn't find it. But um, if you recognize any of these tools, please also, um, you can write it in the chat. Um, they are all handmade, um, old handmade tools uh, created in Puerto Rico by artisans. Yes, Desi, definitely knives and machete actually. There's an ax. Uh, there are things that I don't know quite how to call them, frankly. <laughs> and but there is there's one tool that I think is super amazing. It's called uh, a bamboo splitter, and it's the blue one uh, in top left. Uh, exactly, Jennifer. Equipment's used in a farm. Yes. So. Um, El Departamento de la Comida, this is a close up. This, this, one's, this one's better, actually. Um, El Departamento de la Comida, which is the name of this, it's actually a nonprofit organization. Um, uh, so, El Departamento is, you know, remember that person that I was telling you about in the first uh, like intro that I made, Tara Rodriguez Besosa, the one who told me about this visit to El Junque and how the scientist was saying that we are living through the moment of the Yagrumo. So Tara is the founder of El Departamento de la Comida and she founded it in 2010. And it has gone through different stages in its development. It started as a community-based agricultural project and it distributed um, products from various farms that, that, was, that happened for about two years. Um, then it became a shop and a restaurant, so you could go and buy the agricultural products there, but they weren't distributing them anymore. Um, and when I say distributing was like, you could basically um, order your groceries from them. Uh, and then as Hurricane Maria happened, it destroyed the restaurant and shop that they had. And they became a coordinator of solidarity brigades for the recovery of farms after Hurricane Maria. I don't know if there are any other Puerto Ricans in the chat. I think that someone did mention that they were from Puerto Rico, um, but I'm pretty sure, yes, Marina Rodriguez is from Puerto Rico. Um, Elizabeth, Puerto Rican and Dominican descent. So, um, and as New Yorkers are probably, you know, friends of Puerto Ricans, you probably um, heard. <laughs> of the struggle to get supplies to the island right after the hurricanes and a bunch of us myself included and Tara as well uh, we were caught up you know cut off guard outside of the island right after the hurricane so a lot of people that were in that situation like we traveled back to Puerto Rico with a bunch of supplies and in the case of Tara and her organization uh, well, basically, she transformed her organization to respond to the situation, and they coordinated solidarity brigades, uh, they helped in the recovery of farms, particularly farms that are in their network uh, of kind of, um, uh, they're more like organic based farming. Uh, so they're definitely like uh, uh, an organization that is preoccupied with, uh, with supporting agroecological projects and, and supporting like food sovereignty for Puerto Rico. And I think that this was a very, very important subject to approach in the, in the exhibition, not only because a lot of the artists elsewhere in the exhibition are also thinking about like where their own materials are coming from and rethinking um, what kind of materials they're using now that they are also living in, back in Puerto Rico, which is the case of a couple of other artists um, in the show, that as they move back, they realize that 
it just didn't make sense to use other materials <laughs> uh, or, or they just wanted to reconnect in some way with uh, being back on the island and, and having a different approach to their, so that meant having a different approach to their practice. And in Tara's case, it became, you know, a, an issue of like changing the organization and the people that she worked with. Um, so I invited them to create a pop-up of, uh, of one aspect of their project, which is called La Agroteca. And La Agroteca is a resource library. So they have seeds, uh, they have books, and they have tools. These are the tools that are like the most artisanal tools that you'll find. They're all created by, um, by other farmers in Puerto Rico and people that supply farmers or that are interested in um, agricultural projects in general. But um, they also have like very, you know, like power tools <laughs> uh, and other uh, more, you know, I guess like slightly more practical, but also uh, more cumbersome and definitely expensive, you know, tools to have. So what they do is that the, they've created a membership program and they can share their resources that way. That way. Um, I was also wondering if this is something that um, you guys are also preoccupied by, like where your food is coming from, uh, or if have you ever have you ever had to, you know, the luck of being able to grow your own food? I think that people who live in cities, like we don't have that. Uh, we don't we don't have that opportunity sometimes and we have grown like a little bit apart from that from that possibility but if you're lucky enough you can also comment on it uh i just wanted to share that this tool the blue one on top it's amazing it's a bamboo splitter and you can just use it uh to split up bamboo and then you can create your own fence <laughs> Uh, we had a demonstration in the in the museum and it was pretty pretty fun. Uh, it's very low tech and highly effective. Uh, we also had the uh, we also had the seed bank here, and we had a seed exchange um, event as well. That was great. Um, so exactly, Elizabeth. Some folks advocating urban farms. Yes, um, there are some people advocating for that here in Puerto Rico as well. But it's usually, you know, in their own backyard, not necessarily shared space. There are some abandoned shared spaces um, that have been. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Um, Elizabeth just shared um, information about a program that exists in New York. Um, that's great. Um, there are some abandoned lots that neighbors have turned into um, into like small farms in in San Juan, particularly in Santurce, where there's like a lot of abandoned lots. But uh, it's not like really. I think that it exists in a sort of like liminal legal space. Uh, it's not something that has really been embraced <laughs> by the authorities. I would say. Yes, actually, um, now that Carolina, now that you mentioned fair trade, that's very interesting. Um, Puerto Rico actually has an issue with not necessarily uh, in the fair trade, but definitely kind of fair practices. Um, we have um, we have a lot of agricultural land that is not being properly used, I'd say. Um, in the mid 20th century, there was a law that really prohibited the uh, like land ownership that was over a certain amount of acres, but then like 500 acres. Uh, but there are companies like that through different subsidiaries, uh, they can just you know gobble up more land. And then what ends up happening, what's ha what has happened, is that um, a lot of this land is not used for food production. 
uh, and or to ensure food sovereignty for Puerto Ricans or for export, but rather for um, experimentation with seeds. So for example, like we'll ex Monsanto will experiment with and develop seeds here in Puerto Rico, and then they'll sell them to Argentina. And what happens with these seeds is that you can't, like whatever, whatever grows, like you can't replant it, you have to buy the seeds again. So that creates a huge issue in terms of economics for the farmers, because they have to rely on these uh, modified seeds. Uh, and well, that's not necessarily the greatest business. <laughs> the final work, exactly, yes, yes, Elizabeth, definitely. It is, it, a lot of the food is imported. Uh, and the final piece that I wanted to talk about is Joydi Minaya's work. Joydi is, uh, is an artist that was born in the Dominican Republic. Uh, actually, no, she was born in New York, grew up in the Dominican Republic, and then uh, finished school and then currently lives in, in New York. Um, for a long time, she has created works that relate to kind of uh, imposed notions of tropicality. And she has used the tropical pattern, the kind of the cliche tropical pattern as a way to approach this simultaneous uh, camouflage uh, and hyper visibility and invisibility of the uh, kind of black and brown women's bodies. Sorry, but in this other body of work, instead of using the cliche tropical print, she's creating specific prints for, for monuments. Um, to quote her, she says that she has developed a particular interest in plants, traditions, and spaces linked to histories of resistance and maronage that have taken place in tropical geographies, along with an interest in camouflage, refusal, and opacity both as visual applications, as well as social and philosophical strategies or metaphors. Um, her work is really amazing. I'll just ask you to, like, if you recognize any of these plants, uh, type it up. They have, they have long been a, you know, the, as I was saying, the print fabrics have been, uh, have long been part of her critical toolbox. And she has incorporated these materials via photos, performances, or installations. But the cloakings uh, is the series which we showed two images of, and the wallpaper, the accompanying wallpaper uh, that represents, like, in this case, two real coverings of public monuments that represent colonial legacies. So I'm going to ask you, uh, what kind of plants do you recognize? Um, I'll mention tobacco here. Um, this is um, Chile, Chile Manero. I don't know what you call this in English, Malag Malagueta, type it up. Achiote. Achiote. And they all represent different, uh, different plants that have been used uh, as uh, actually like they're plants of resistance. So um, there are the, these print coverings are designed as metaphors of resistance that incorporate plants used by Native American, Black and, and Afro-Caribbeans in different rituals, um, but also for poison, healing, purging, um, cleansing as well, uh, casting evil spirits away uh, or for protection. And the red, uh, the red wallpaper, uh, which uh, I mean, the design was used to create this covering for a sculpture of uh, Christopher Columbus, this image here. Um, that one, the, the series of uh, like the selection of plants that came together was through 
research that she did with um, ethnobotanists and, um, and a couple of anthropologists as well from the Dominican Republic so that they could, so that she could come up with this list of plants that kind of meant something to this, uh, to this Maniel community, basically. So this community of people that were resisting together are learning from each other uh, from like how to use a chiote maybe as you know for for war paint or for cooking but also um to learn that malagueta for example it is both uh a plant that can be used for healing but it's also uh it also contains resin so it is poisonous um or or that juca manioc it was used in mass suicides for indigenous peoples that refused to be enslaved for example. So this is knowledge that was shared between communities um, and that also represents like particular geographies in the Caribbean that, that were shared spaces. So caves, mountains, mountain, like mountainous retreats, all these um, areas of what we, we would call uh, uh, manieles or in the Dominican Republic, they call it un maniel, right? Um, and in the case of this other uh, Juan Ponce de Leon statue, uh, it's covered in manzanilla, it's covered in uh, manchineal, and that is super, super poisonous. Um, like if it rains and you're under that tree, it can actually kill you. Uh, so, and that's actually what killed Juan Ponce de Leon. Uh, so I, I chose these images because they were very evocative of like this uh, challenges that were being that have been uh, uh, brought up, but in particular in 2020 they were being they were even more relevant. So um, I think that these uh, these questions about like what is being exalted in monuments is you know ever more present. Um, I, and I think that we should, what is the name of the tree? Uh, uh, Manchineal. What's the name in Spanish? Yeah. Very poisonous tree and that was the one that uh, killed him. So they used an arrow and like a poisonous arrow and it killed him. Uh, but I think we should go to the q and right? <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Curator Regis Franco. I, yeah. Before we open up the floor for questions, I'd like to just send a thank you to Columbia University and to the Latino Alumni Association for this opportunity of hosting us tonight. Also, uh, as you know, um, get involved, connect with us, and uh, share your interests so we can have more events that will be as thought-provoking as the one that Curator Regis Franco just shared with us. Now um, the floor is open for questions, so please um, share your video, unmute yourself, or just put the question on the chat and we'll read it out loud. Don't be shy. Um, I just wanted to say like something that I didn't mention is that the reason why the two images of Joydi's work are so different from each other, uh, one is very, it's very obvious that it's like, very customized for the statue and the other one is not, is because one was made uh, after she received an invitation from an organization in Miami. So everything had, you know, its proper permit. Uh, even though actually someone vandalized the work and took it down and like took the label off and, and took the fabric so they had to make it again. So obviously like someone was, insulted by it or someone really wanted to preserve like, you know, Juan Ponce de Leon or she did two interventions in Miami. One was a Ponce de Leon statue and the other one was a Christopher Columbus statue. They're both like literally in a parking lot facing in downtown Miami, like facing um, the bay, a bay. But it's definitely not in any like particularly prominent you know space. It's literally a parking lot. Uh, but everything, but you know, but that, that's the power of like colonial images. In the Dominican Republic, they never replied to, 
uh, to the request for permit. So they did it anyway. <laughs> I would just like to bring to the table um, a couple words that you would use, uh, Curator Reyes. And you said colonial legacies. So I was wondering if you can expand a bit more on that and how uh, contemporary Latin American artists are addressing those apart from the examples that you shared us, but for action-driven initiatives in their community, not solely through art, but also in the way we live our everyday. Well, um, I think that definitely uh, something that I was talking about now, you know, in relation to like food sovereignty is it, it's one of these ways in which like the interest of just, you know, reg, like it's like artists as citizens, really. Uh, and so it's not something that necessarily has to do with art or art making. It's rather like how you live your life um, or how you choose to spend your money uh, as well. But I think that's a way. I think that there are a lot of people that um, that have gone. I mean, I don't know numbers specifically, but definitely like it's something that at least here in Puerto Rico, it feels very real and kind of, it's kind of palpable that like people going back to farming or choosing to buy land and uh, even pulling mo uh, money together, friends, deciding that they want to own land before it's too late even if it's not necessarily producing at the moment but just kind of thinking ahead in that sense like maybe i i think that <laughs> i don't know if it's like a doomsday scenario that we all have to retreat from the coast <laughs> and we need to go to a mountain somewhere like high above sea level or something but it's kind of interlinked uh i think that it it relates to like how do we want to live our lives and uh, how we can use our own resources to keep living here. Um, so I think that that's one way. I think that Carolina Caicedo's work is also like very, um, it, it's such an example of like a very ethical way of relating to um, not only, not, I mean, not only to directly affected indigenous communities, but also like activist groups uh, that are living there. I mean, Carolina was born in, was born in London, but she's a Colombian uh, and she lives in LA. Uh, so she's like this transnational artist, but at the same time, she's very much embedded within these networks of activism, whether it be in Colombia or, um, you know, with tenants unions in, in LA. Um, and I think that there is also another, there is also another, someone is mentioning the cookies in the background. Yes. <laughs> cookies and like toads in the street. Um, Would you like to mention a bit about the video we saw at the beginning of the presentation? Perhaps? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, that's a song by, that's a song by Mima. Um, and it talks about, it's called El Arca de Mima. And El Arca de Mima is a song um, she just, I mean, she released it without it being on an album or anything. Um, but it's also uh, a song for a film that just came out uh, that another friend of ours made, Gisela, uh, Gisela Rosario. Uh, it's called Perfume de Gardenias. So I'm going to type it here. Um, and the song is about all these kind of kinds of, you know, plants of, like fruits, all these fruits that we don't know how they taste or we're forgetting how they taste because we don't have access to them. So in a kind of globalized economy where we've, we have developed all these tastes and all these kind of need and desire for things that we don't, we don't produce, like we don't grow kiwis here. <laughs> you know, we don't grow kiwis, we don't grow like strawberries, uh, except for like some, you know, random strawberries and like roadside in a mountain. Uh, but we have developed these tastes and that's also you know part of the colonial legacies of having to import all of you know everything that we consume and i think that's the case with many with many islands uh we are we have developed the tastes of the people who also want to visit here and the people who want to um who want to feel comfortable here uh i've been reading 
uh, a book. It's kind of old, um, but it's a book about the development of the, like tourism in the Caribbean and how in many cases, like the, the, they're catering to the tourist space so much that um, agriculture is not really considered, like it's not really developed to even supply these hotels uh, that are in these islands. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we have a very weird, uh, like I think that Puerto Rico is apart from other parts in the Caribbean because of our particular relation to like US trade uh, and how it is, imposed on us that we need we have to trade with them only basically um but i think that it's also something that is shared in in the region uh and also like we don't have like in south america we don't have a particular regional economic block that we can trade with uh and in our particular case which is not necessarily a legacy it's rather a present colonial you know present colonialism uh, well, that is something that really impedes other kinds of development and relationships within the region. Jennifer Fuentes put on the chat, taking back our roots and self-sufficient. Jennifer, would you like to mute yourself and expand a bit about that? Jennifer, where are you? <laughs> or even on the chat, if you like. Uh, Oh, it's okay. No worries. We got you. So, <laughs> here. so uh, you want to put in the chat a bit more uh, of uh, your ideas with those comments there? I'm getting loud. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, you see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, uh -huh. Go ahead. Yeah. No, it's it's something that is that's that's happening. Um, because, but I think I mean I'm I'm also. Pessimist. <laughs> uh, I think that a lot of um, a lot of realizations that it, you know people are are having now are a little bit too late. Uh, not only like fifty years too late, but uh, um, in in certain regards to like really urgent things that are happening are at least five years too late. Um, there are tax incentives that are bringing in people with like high you know with a lot of money uh, and they're incentivized to come and live here. Uh, they don't pay any taxes. They are evading federal taxes. Uh, and then there's also the, and, and I think that the pandemic has also exacerbated that. So there's a set of laws that were instituted in 2012, Act 20 and Act 22, and they are incentivizing uh, that movement of people uh, and, you know, basically tax evaders to, to come here. I think that's also, that. I mean, that also happens in other Caribbean islands. There are like citizenship schemes in different places where like, if you buy a house in St. Kitts, uh, you, you're, you can become a citizen and then just like basically pay no tax anywhere. Uh, but that's happening here. And and I think that people are realizing now that as our generation, like, you know, I'm 37, as our generation grows older, it's like we don't have the same, uh, you know, the same possibility of acquiring anything. And, and if you want to buy something, it's really, really expensive. And it's also because these people are driving up prices. So there is this like late realization of a lot of things. <laughs> Elizabeth Angeles, would you like to uh, ask the question? If Sure. Is my mic working? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. I just wanted to know that if, um, if there are key ways that you see that people on the mainland, um, whether, you know, from Puerto Rican descent or not, can support local artists, the work that you're doing, um, and just local economy maybe considerations we should take when we visit or anything at all that you think we should be mindful of as we think about being allies and supporters yeah um god it's so complicated <laughs> it's i mean it's really complicated because i understand um the
Like, I mean, yes. <laughs> the, the question, I mean, the answer is yes, there are ways, of course. Um, it's, it, it's like how to be, it's about how, how you can be mindful. It's like if you, if you decide to stay in a building that, you know, where all the apartments are on Airbnb, that's a bad choice. Like, it's easy. You know, if it just looks too Airbnb, it don't. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, because it's, it, that's, that's a way, um, that's one of the main ways that people are getting displaced. Um, it's just like whole buildings being bought up. Um, and, and it, I mean, it's happening because of stateside companies, but also people that move here and decide that there is their investment uh and 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 then you know sadly there's also uh a lot of locals that have decided that that's the way i think that there are people that have made it their business and uh live in, in you know in the building that they also rent out and I, I think that's legitimate um it's also a very convenient way to travel of course um but you know just be mind i think that that is the primary thing just like be mindful of that um and because that's one of the first like expenses that you take care of, I guess. Uh, and then, you know, um, I, I think that as in general in, in the region, it's like go beyond, you know, sun, sea and sand. Uh, it's like, check out whether, you know, what's the cultural offering, like what exhibitions are out there, what galleries are have, you know, are, are open. And, and there's quite a lot of, you know, of, of cultural activity and that's, that's what's cool about it uh that that it's not you know the main thing that is being advertised definitely <laughs> and that's that's one of the problems and on that note uh, i would like to thank you uh three the raiders because you showed us a sliver of the contemporary artistic milieu of latin america tonight opening so many topics of discussion through the art that you presented to us in your exhibition and not only that, but raising all these social concerns that leave us pondering and inquiring more. And like um, our audience members also asked, what can we do to be better, to be more conscious about our choices, right? And with that, I know we're a bit, of, um, you know, I'll, um, over time, but of course, come on, we're Latin Americans, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> just a shout out here. Uh, would you just take a second, please, and leave us with a takeaway for action? Apart from the one that you just mentioned now, but like a key takeaway from your heart that you might say, if this is all you live with from this presentation, here it goes. Me. Yeah, you. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> wow. Damn. Um no pressure, mm -hmm. no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. It's a conversation, you know, it's a word with family here. Um I mean I, at least for me, for me it was very gratifying to work on the show because it was a way to bring together many conversations that I had probably between 2012 and last year. Uh, so it was really a way to share like my own kind of, you know, travels and then like discovery and, and connections that I was able to make with, with people that are, you know, very dear to me that are, that's, you know, a lot of them are good friends. And, and I think that that was the main thing that I wanted to share, you know, like this is affecting all of us. And it doesn't have to be a conversation that is rooted in trauma, but or or that reinforces the trauma, mm -hmm. but that rather um, presents us with with alternatives and kind of creative solutions and the ways in which people have worked through that trauma, um, or that they are doing it, you know, doing the work at the moment, so that it doesn't feel like like we are you know, just stuck. And even though I admit I'm like super pessimistic <laughs> at the same time, uh, I really wanted people to take away to, you know, to, to be positive when they left the show. Like I always think about like what the narrative, like what's the, you know, like I, as people walk through the galleries, like what, what's the state that they're gonna feel in in each space. 
And I really wanted the end of the show to feel more, you know, so people can feel more hopeful uh, at the end. Nostalgic though, because at the end, the, the last piece, the final piece of the show is a video by Alora and Calzadilla in which uh, a parrot is speaking to us. And it's actually, not, not literally, it's in captions, um, but, but the parrot is the subject and, and, and what the parrot is saying, basically she's like chastising humanity. Like, you don't wanna to speak to us. You don't wanna to talk to us. Like we live here, you, you've created these gadgets to speak to aliens and to reach out to other civilizations that you don't even know exist, but we're here. And we're these like intelligent beings around you. Um, <laughs> so it, it was also on that note that people left the the exhibition like just be more conscious of your surroundings um, and yeah and that's the takeaway perfect perfect and apropos yeah. to jennifer's coming here proud to be latina moment i love that so with that we'll close it shout out to latin america keep it going thank you for representing the region so marvelously at curator ladies and we'll see you in the next LACO event so please stay in touch connect we might be sending out some uh, emails and communication. Uh, participate so we know your interest, okay? Uh, very well, thanks again. Have a wonderful night, evening, wherever you might be in the world. Keep going with that positive energy. Bye, thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, everyone, bye-bye.